Thank you everyone for joining. Appreciate it. Rachel's not here tonight. She's on vacation with her family. So um, I'll be providing the minutes for this meeting. Um, but the first thing then is to approve the April minutes, which I which uh, Rachel sent out a few days ago. So I'm looking for a motion to approve April's meeting minutes. Uh, I'll move to approve April. Jennifer. I'll second. Thank you, Rita. Mm -hmm. And then we'll go on to our the bulk of tonight. We're going to go over the presentations for the city council. So you don't need to stay from that for your city council. Great, yeah. because I had, I had to leave a meeting halfway through to come here. Oh. So if you can cut me loose early, oh, that's yep. terrific. You don't want to listen to that two times in a row. But maybe, but no. <laughs> So anyway, we've got a few informational items and a few updates, and then we'll um, dive into the uh, update for the city council and the mayor, which is Wednesday. So um, for our city uh, council liaison report, Councilor Parker. Right. Can you just see and hear me there online? Yes. Uh, well, first, uh, I, the meeting was with uh, uh, Councilor uh, Chris Banks, and uh, he said, that if they want some money, I'm going to give it to them if they're willing to uh, expand the number of interpretive signs around town. Aww. He saw the one down by the big park, and he said, I'd like to see those all over. He said the, the uh, washed out uh, loading dock on the river, you know, how about a sign saying, you know, what that was, was for, and different things around. So, uh, and, and, and I already got two votes. Because I'm, I'm totally in support of that. Remember, uh, I had earlier introduced the idea of the logging book, mm -hmm. having some urban signs. I did well. talk to Jerry about that. But uh, I think we're, uh, I, I, I forget where I was. City Forward's another place, medium sized city, that had some of these signs. And it just makes a huge difference of realizing that this, this place has a path. So, anyway, quickly. Uh, budgets. Um, we've got two budget things happening. Uh, one, this month we're going to be having budget hearings uh, in preparation for the new budget that starts in July. So we're going to be looking at, at things that we're going to fund for the next year. Uh, that should be fun uh, because uh, revenues have been uh, up. And so uh, we're actually going to be able to make some investments that we haven't before. Then we also have some, some end of year spending. And I always feel kind of like I have to explain this because so many people think about, oh, it's typical government, use it or lose it, spend it on pencil sharpeners or something so you, you don't lose it. Actually, that is totally untrue. All money that you don't spend is rolled over into the next year's budget. Um, but what it does do in some cases, in some programs, that money that we had set aside for one project that we can't get to this year, that it leaves some funds for us to do some, some other, other things. Uh, in addition, I think I mentioned earlier about our, our urban renewal district that's funded by bonds where we went and refinanced the bonds and came up with $6 million uh, of unscheduled funds. Uh, Jamie has been working on this. I love our city manager. He just makes every director have three or four jobs. <laughs> so uh, she's working with Public Works on this. Um, but one of the things that uh, is in this uh, is uh, our alley police. Alleys of downtown are the city's responsibility. And last year I got to spend some time in, in Europe and, and notice how, how often they use their alleys as, as, as a, a, a pedestrian ways. So uh, I talked to Jerry Nelson at Public Works and he came up with a double number to, to read the, uh, the alleys. And then so Councilor Sheriff Spoon said, What about lighting? And, and, and that got consensus. So it, it, I just think it's, it's kind, of a, kind of a neat thing. I like alleys. They're going to be repaved and, and they're going to have lights. So 
that's going to be coming out of the six point six million dollars. Oh, and here's a funny political thing. You know, we've got a, a split of conservatives and progressives on the council. Conservatives wanted to put the money back into the urban renewal and and, and the district earlier. We're still waiting on the numbers on, on what that means because of the way these are revenue bonds, reverse amortization, it, it may not make much of a difference. But the funny thing was that we had a meeting uh, to go over proposed budgets and ideas to spend the six point six million dollars, and we could only come up with four million. <laughs> we couldn't even spend it all. So we either have some additional funds there, or we can indeed try to, to buy it down. Uh, uh, a, a lot of governments are finding themselves uh, in an extraordinary place uh, with, with some of the ARPA funding and, and uh, taxes, income taxes of, 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 of several billion dollars of unanticipated funds there. So, heavy. Got two million dollars from the legislature uh, on Walnut Street extension. Pull from the uh, industrial park out to 99 to relieve some of the pressure on the Fred Meyer intersection. We had already figured out through different pots of money how we do that. And the legislature said, well, we got $2 million for that. Well, okay, we'll take it. But then that, that frees up that money to go somewhere else. And Jerry hasn't even had time to figure out where that's going to go. So, what this means is we're going to be able to make some investments in our infrastructure, in our streets. And, and one of the things that the city of Wilsonville found ten years ago when they brought up their streets to, to a level A standard is that their maintenance, annual maintenance costs dropped. That, you know, think about it with your health house. You know, you, you bring it up to a certain level and it's easier to take care of. So we've got that going on. Um, city of Camby's been facing some staffing shortage. Um, our, our, I came in one afternoon to see our uh, aquatic center uh, director, Eric. It was about three o'clock in the afternoon. He said, things here at 4 a.m. to open. And my kids want to be lifetimes. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, um, but when, when my kid, my son was in high school, that was the, that was a cool job. Yeah. And um, and then the other thing, just I, it just still kind of shakes me that uh, a week or two ago we got notice that the library was going to open up late because they had some absences and that sort of thing, and they weren't going to be the ones. So um, uh, the council has has let staff now. The person know that, that we believe that retention is easier than recruitment. And, uh, we're doing a compensation study, uh, taking a look at our salaries across the region. Um, and uh, we want to make sure that we are competitive in every way uh, to keep our staff. We lost Eric, uh, our planner, uh, in the city of Portland, and uh, we. we um, so we'll see alleys. Um, that can sort of just parks off. We've got a master plan coming down the pike for the parks, and uh, that's probably going to be in the next month. And uh, we had preliminary information that came out, um, and it's uh, the top three things are our trails. Uh, improved maintenance on our existing parks uh, and a dog park. Well, the, the council, the majority of the council, has fast tracked the uh, dog park. And uh, so we may even pay for that out of this year's funds in terms of, of getting the engineering done and that sort of thing. I've even been able to get the conservatives on board with, with some of these projects of saying with inflation at, at 8.2%. For services and supplies, that if we're going to build something, even if we build it six months earlier, we can probably save some money. 
So um, anyway, we're, we're going to fast track that dog park is going to be uh, on territorial, uh, where territorial intersects the uh, log, uh, logging road trail. Uh, Eagle Park is there, oh. and 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 in just this one little tucked away uh, corner there. But at the same time, we're putting in some sidewalks and putting in a real flush bathroom mm -hmm. nice. both by the dog park and by the logging road. And they're making that four way stop for the bus. Yes. Yeah. And then finally, uh, Rose, um, uh, Ivy is going to be redone uh, this year. Um, this, I'm, I'm still furious about this. But 99 has been delayed. It was, going, it was going to be a spring summer project. And and we too much competition out in, in the in the world. We try and find uh, contractors who could work this summer. So we're gonna rebid it for a fall spring project. So part of the work is gonna be done in at the end of this year, and then the rest of it is gonna be done getting in next year. But that's gonna be is repaving uh, all the time. Thank you so much. I almost feel like we have the insights <laughs> here. I <laughs> love it. Thank you. All right. So I have a quick recap. So, Ron, since you were last with us, I joined the planning commission, and that doesn't change my role here. But um, so I provide a very brief update of the, what's been going on at the planning commission during the month. And we meet twice a month. Uh, there's been a lot. There's a lot of work going on with code updates. The city code needs some updates in various areas. So we spend some time almost every meeting talking about some various code updates. Probably not worth discussing here. Although there is a code update that Carol and I are meeting with the planning staff on Thursday. Carol Palmer and I are meeting with them because there's been a section of the code that, that uh, affects heritage that's already in the code that. Uh, we've had some updates kind of waiting in the wings for a while. So uh, Don Hardy graciously agreed to meet with us so we can get that plugged in. Um, it's a pretty quick and easy thing to do. But other than code updates, the biggest um, update was from our last meeting that a large industrial development was approved. Um, it's a steel mill, very similar to what American Steel, which is, if you remember, it's across the street from the Zion Sanitary. And they make girders, that's all they make. And so they're going in um, on the corner of Sequoia and 13th. If you go down that way, there's on one side, there's the Timber Park uh, subdivision. On the other side, there's an old, old um, hazelnut grove that's defunct. I mean, I haven't seen anybody in there in a long time. So they bought that property and they're gonna be putting a steel mill in there. So um, that's big news, you know, more, more development in the industrial zone. So that's, that was approved last week. I, I'll excuse myself, yes. but if I have, might, might be able to comment on your report on the planning commission. Oh. The applicants had changed a few of the numbers <laughs> between their original report and their secondary report. Nobody caught it. That's you. <laughs> it was everybody plays a role. We all yeah, play a role in different things. Nice. And, and she was really, and she's leaving out the best part because of her hard work and the commissions, the council is now on Wednesday going to give final approval to a food card ordinance. Great. That was an interesting meeting. That was, that was but besides the planning commission, it's, it's such a great group. Um, our planning department in the city is awesome to work with. One of the reasons I joined the planning commission is because I had worked with Don Hardy a little bit on the historic city hall challenges that we had, and he was so wonderful to work with. We just clicked, and he's amazing, and his staff is amazing. And then, and um, to Councilor Parker's point, everybody on the planning commission has a different background. You know, some people have lived here a long time, some people have been on planning commissions before, some people have worked with developers a lot. Uh, and I'm kind of the numbers data geek. You guys know that. So anyway, it's she, a great group. She was awesome. By the way, I talked to uh, our city attorney today, and uh, she may have more of an update on this. 
but he said he's keeping a close eye on the uh, City Hall renovation historic project. I'm not sure that, that proceeds <laughs> at some sort. Of anyway, thank you all. Yeah, thank Great. you. Thanks, Thanks for your service. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, one other information item is the Candy Arch is uh, tentatively there's a plan for the ribbon cutting ceremony, which is the first Thursday of June, which I have as the second. And so there'll be more information about that. So that'd be good. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, that's in conjunction with first Thursday market. Yeah. And so we're happy that um, we're able to come in. Awesome. And we want to just wait until so all of the board of committees will get invitations um, to the ribbon cutting. Um, we're just going to wait till after this first Thursday, which is in three days, so that it's not confusing and we don't have people showing up on the wrong night. Um, and Tyler has done, if you haven't been out for a first Thursday downtown, Tyler has done a great job in a short amount of time of growing the event. Um, I think we have 30 businesses participating, which we've never had numbers like that before. Um, and there's some lots of fun things. So uh, another business is doing a ribbon cutting. So I just we don't want to like confuse, but we want you guys will all be invited and I'll, I'll be sending those out probably either on Friday or early morning. So you may remember that we collaborated on content for the plaques that are on the arch. So thank you, Jennifer. So I haven't seen them put up yet. Maybe anyway, I'm sure they will be for the ribbon cutting. No rush, but <laughs> anyway, so our role in that is that we provided the content for the for three of the um, interpretive or commemorative plaques. So that's kudos to us. <laughs> All right, so that's it for info items. Um, yeah, okay, so quick project updates. Uh, so, Carol Palmer and I are meeting with uh, Northwest Vernacular. They'll be one of them will be here on Wednesday. They're working on the very detailed, what we call a context and level survey of the fairgrounds. And they're doing some research in town. And Carol, who, you know, she's the research amazing. Nobody researches better than I know. And so, she and I are going to meet with them. Um, with Katie from uh, Northwest Vernacular while they're here on Wednesday to finish up that research on the fairgrounds, and then they'll be writing up a large document for that. Uh, Zion Memorial, so thank you, Tyler. We got the grants, and we got the grant in for next year, and there's an approval process that happens in a couple weeks, so I'll find out soon, um, and I'm sure they will approve our grant for this coming year. And then also Tyler entered in our final grant uh, report for last year. And, um, Karina, you had a question. Karina has graciously volunteered when she just has some free time to go over and, and clean up some of the uh, markers, which is so sweet of you, so nice. I was going to ask you, would you mind keeping the D2 and the sprayer at your place then? I mean, is that okay? Absolutely. Yeah, I've got a good, safe, locked uh, shed that I could keep it in. So. But you can see where it is now. I mean, it's like locked up like in Fort Knox. Anyway, so we'll get that to you. Um, we, I haven't to order yet so i will but we'll get that to you so thank you so much for offering to do that That's yes great. definitely thank you we're lamenting last time about how many there are left to clean <laughs> anyway we'll get through it um so we have the um it's really a clg grant the um certified local government grant which we're using for reconnaissance surveys with northwest vernacular so they are finishing up that work as we speak. Um, they sent it to the state, which is a requirement, and the state's really backlogged. So normally we would have expected their original plan was to have a like a final draft to us in April, but it's not their fault, it's the state's fault. But it'll all get done and uh, we'll soon hear from them and have a final draft to look at and then we'll be, um, I guess we'll schedule some sort of a public meeting, uh, a candy public meeting to go through that results of that. So that's coming up and that's making good progress. Um, then we have next year's CLG grant, which the grant needs to be entered by June of next year. And where is it? Anyway, next year. Yeah. Or I'm sorry, February. February. Yes, February. Thank you. 
And so, but we've got a little bit of green work to do. You know, we've, we've just been taking areas around downtown, a few blocks here and there. And so I'm gonna uh, meet with the planning department and talk about well, what area do we wanna do next? Because they have a pretty good idea of where development might be occurring, especially given the changes that's being facing the legislature changing about you know density and cities and everything. So I have yet to meet with Don and then we'll talk about next steps for that, but we have to do a little bit of free work late this year, late, late this year to um, be prepared for submitting that grant request in February. So uh, we do plan on doing that, another um, grant for that. And then the time capsule, uh, which um, I know that Rachel is in the final stages, the time capsule is going to go with the historic city hall. Rachel's got that gathering the content, so that's in its final stages. Did we get a final on the time capsule for the arch? Yeah, so um, so the city is also going to do a time capsule with the arch. It was in the plans. Um, when it was built. So actually, if you're driving on Grant, I think that's on the right-hand side, one of the spots is, is a little deeper, and that is made for an arch or for a time capsule to go in. And so um, we're going to open it up. Um, I think it should be, the verbiage should be approved by Scott tomorrow um, and, and do a time capsule for that as well. And so um, I think that the, the plan on that is to also send you know an email to all of our boards and committees, um, just if people have suggestions or ideas. But if you do, you can uh, reach out to me, and I'll be running that. Something I would ask is that we not put it on handy now because we've already, we've already done that for ours. Okay. Ours. Well, um, the city doesn't post on handy now. It's a volunteer posted or something, but um, but we can. I'll be very explicit about where it's going and, and what that, you know, what that looks like. We'll have a graphic and it will talk about location. So okay. hopefully that will she make it. it. Yeah. Okay. And then the only other uh, project update I have is the logging bridge across Highway 99, the railroad bridge. That uh, one of the things Councilor Parker was talking about is that the city has urban renewal funds and plans to use that to make that nicer looking to do some improvements and also they have us a stairway that goes down from the bridge at Highway 99. So people walking across the logging road across 99 need to get down from, they don't have to slide down on the side of the piece, whatever. Um, and then as part of that, uh, we'll be involved in developing some content for signage, for interpretive signage, because uh, there's a lot of history with that road, as you know. And so Carol gave me a few ideas. So I've talked with um, the public works department here. And so they know I'm not, and they said, we'll get to you as soon as it makes sense, because it's a long process to, you know, get all the plans put together and get the contractors and everything. So they, they're appreciative of getting some help with getting some content or, or some interpretive signage for that. So. And if there's anything I can do to help facilitate, okay. I'm also helping public works on the bridge project. Okay, thank you. That's all I have for updates. So then the main discussion things, um, the Oregon Heritage Conference was last week, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and um, Carol and I attended. Uh, it was via Zoom this year. They hope to do it um, in person in Corvallis, but, but I'll tell you what, I've been through their conferences via Zoom before, and if anybody does it well, oh my gosh, they are like the, I don't know, the poster child for the best Zoom meetings you could possibly have. They outsource it, that's why because there, you know, there are Zoom experts out there. And so um, it's very engaging and very well done and couldn't be better and um, a great group of folks and very well managed, which you have to do, you know, if you're gonna have a three-day conference, it's hard to keep people engaged online for three days, let alone sitting in a conference room, right? After you've had lunch or something. Anyway, so they even sent a package ahead of time that had snacks, uh, things, during little breakout sessions. And so they did as much as they could, uh, giving people, getting people engaged. And so you'd have to like draw something and hold it up to your Zoom screen and everybody would hold up something. Anyway, it was really well done. But the content as usual, this conference just blows me away. This is um, managed by um, Curry Gill, uh, K-U-R-I Gill, who uh, that's who we work with for all of our, our CLG grants and for the Zion grant. 
and um, they had many, many amazing speakers. And then we had lots of breakout opportunities to meet with people on subject areas that we were interested in. And then Carol and I got together in advance and tried to make sure that we went to different sessions so we could compare our notes. And then in some cases, we went to the same session or the same you know, keynote speaker. We were like kids in school because we were texting each other during the, the meetings and saying, do you like this speech? Because I don't, you know, I got much more bad. <laughs> and after each session, we would compare notes. So anyway, it was good. But I, I thought, how am I going to boil this ocean? My head was exploding. By Friday afternoon, I just almost couldn't take in any more information. And it was so interesting and so fun to see what's the state doing, what does the state recommend, and what are the other cities doing with what. So I decided I was going to share three things because that's, I, we could spend an hour and a half or hours, I don't know, but we'll, and, and I have all these notes that I need to type up to get them out. But so three things that were kind of ahas for me from this meeting. There was a lot of discussion about what they call rock art. As, as a heritage resource. And that would be what you and I might call pictograph, you know, or something, or, you know, um, you know tribal drawings on, on a rock. And they're called rock art. And I didn't, I've never heard them referred to that way before. And the person, they have many archeologists in this conference and they are fascinating to listen to. And they just, oh, my head, but amazing. And what they said is, of course, a lot of it, you know, has been interpreted now and they understand a lot of what it tells us about indigenous history and you know what they were doing, but they're finding just as much that it's not necessarily something that is of tremendous heritage value other than the fact that it's there and it's ancient, but they've found several now that they've figured out the interpretation might be, oh, this is a good place to fish. <laughs> <laughs> or I was feeling artistic today. That was an example they used. So, they were just trying to explain how if people are, you know, trying to set these sites aside if they haven't been already, that you really have to know that the interpretation, we learned, they learned a lot about the interpretation of them, and they're not always what we might have thought as, you know, that, you know, it's all about their hunting or something, but anyway, that was, that was pretty interesting to hear an archaeologist kind of trying to crack some jokes, that was pretty good. <laughs> Um, the biggest one, and this one I've heard about before, and I think um, Tyler and Jamie and Carol and I have talked about it. This is coming from many sources. It's called unused upper floors. And if you think about downtown Canby that has some, you know, commercial buildings, if you will, the older ones, they have upstairs that are not always utilized, or they're utilized in a way that doesn't house people. You know, they have storage up there or something, or maybe nothing. And so towns are really, um, they're, you know, because we need more density, we need more housing, towns are starting to scratch their heads about, well, how can we provide housing? You know, would the owners of these buildings be willing to do that if there was some help with, re with refurbishing? And uh, Jamie, it was you that said to me that, you know, it's very expensive because some of these buildings are 100 plus years old and to try to bring them up to code and make sure they're fire safe and everything is very, very expensive. So this is a huge topic all around the state. And um, one of the presentations I went to was University of Oregon, um, what's the name of this group? The Institute for Policy and Engagement. And they are completing a how-to guide, working with the state on how cities can best address this. And they are only looking at cities that have less than 30,000 30, people like us. And they had some examples of some uh, business owners in Albany, McMinnville, Astoria that have gone through this process and can share, you know, what worked and what didn't work. And then the university is working with the state to come up with better funding or tax abatement ideas or something, but it's coming. So we know that the state is very interested in helping these business owners, you know, uh, utilize this space to help with the housing crunch that we have right now turn them into a condo or an apartment or something. So um, some of the buildings around downtown here are occupied as apartments. You can kind of see, see a cat on a porch or something or a barbecue or something, like above Ebner's. That's the only one I can think of, but I'm sure you've seen that. Gwyn's also, if you go from the back. Oh, yeah, Gwyn's, yeah. 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 So anyway, it's getting a huge amount of airplay, and I'm sure we'll be seeing some more from the state and from the universities. But there are a lot of people that are saying, basically, how can we help these cities and these business owners 
you know, you have these uh, upper floors available for people to live in. So that was cool. Um, then there was, of course, I have, there was a breakout session on historic cemeteries. Of course, I had to go. <laughs> and, oh my gosh, it was interesting. So ancestry tourism is on the rise. You know, as people get their DNA tested and they find they have a great, great aunt in Candy they didn't know about or whatever. And so that also means that um, uh, cemetery tourism is on the rise. And some cities are starting to take advantage of that in really unique ways. I don't remember if I mentioned this before, but there are a few towns on the coast, Coos Bay and some of the surrounding towns. They put together a tourism brochure that's called the Historic Cemetery Trail to help people that are visiting cemeteries to know where they, where they are along the coast in that area, Coos Bay, and what those cemeteries might offer. And then the cemeteries are using grant dollars to bring in more interpretive information on signage that that is um, more historic, and uh, I'll show you some, signs, some examples of that in, in my PowerPoint presentation, but they're starting to look more at, well, how people are visiting the cemeteries, not to visit one person or go to a, uh, you, know, a, you know, a funeral necessarily, but they're looking because they're looking for people that they didn't know they were related to, and they're, or they want to know about the history, about how did they fit in. And I had some visitors staying with us personally over the weekend, and I was telling them a little bit about this, and they said, oh, yeah, we just found out we had a great, great, great uncle in Indi and independence, and we didn't even know we had any family in Oregon at all. And they were all excited about it. Anyway, so you never know. <laughs> and then in Oregon, Chamber of Commerce, they put together what they call a cemetery detective book. And this is what really caught my eye. So this one, they put kind of like, a, it's sort of like a uh, scavenger hunt or the history that is in that cemetery. So it might say, like we could say for Zion, you know, go to section four, row G, number 12, and that's Abraham Lincoln's best friend who happens to be buried in Zion. Or go to this one row and they're a family of four and they all have the same death date. What do you think happened? And we could leave, you know, notes or things, clues. And it could be good for just tourism or for school groups or for scout groups just to get them interested and understand all the history that's out there. So um, someone's going to send me that detective book. I, I know. So much for so many different reasons. Imagine you could, we could make it really interesting. Yeah. Not, and it wouldn't cost much because we have yeah. all the information. Yeah. Yeah. And like, this, but the chain, that's okay. But the Chamber of Commerce did in Bandage was they made it um, like a detective, like a passport you have to fill out. You have to say, yeah, this is the person's name. We found it. We read it. This is the person's name. And then you fill out this detective book or your passport and you take it back to the Chamber of Commerce and you get some like little thing like I'm a history detective or something like that, you know. And I guess they found that to be, again, part of kind of cemetery heritage tourism or the fact that there's so much history there in their cemetery. Help the, the people in that area and the kids have some fun, like a, a real scavenger hunt. So I thought that would be something. There's also a, a thing um, in the old health community on Instagram right now where people are sharing information on the houses that they own now that they've restored. There's a big movement to find out the, where the people are buried that had your house oh. and they're going, yeah, this is great you brought this up because I've, I've noticed it like in the last two months or so that they're sharing research on their or, oh, you know, I have this house, I've restored it, it's, you know, 100 whatever years old, these are the people that lived in the house, um, and they're going on these trips. I have two friends on there that in the past month have said, hey, we went, you know, um, to the local cemetery to actually find the people that, that built our house and lived in our house, and they're taking pictures of the headstones and they're doing full histories on their feeds awesome. of the people and they're trying to do research to find pictures of them and they're kind of doing, you know, homage to the people that built their house and lived in their houses. So it's so funny because it's it was cemetery work. So. Cemeteries are where it's at. Yeah, it's like a big, big weekend out. Yeah. And now with the family, oh, let's go find these other people that Oh, and stuff. So, oh. funny you brought that up. It's kind of a trend. It's, yeah. it's truly a trend. Interesting. Okay. 
Okay, well, so stay tuned for that. So I have a question. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I, have a question. I was going to say, what was your favorite thing of the conference? I mean, obviously those are like three highlights, but is one of those or or something else like that you learned your favorite session? I don't know. Uh, I'll look at my notes, but my favorite thing, this isn't something I learned, and you'll hear me talk about this a little if you listen to the Wednesday's council meeting, is there was a speaker that really poked fun of the grant process and what a pain in the it is. Oh. And I was thinking of Tyler and all of us who've been through it, and this guy was hilarious. Oh, oh my gosh. I mean, he just were like, yeah, baby, someone didn't understand. <laughs> it was like, and he has the microphone. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have to look at my notes. Um, I think the up and floors thing just keeps rolling through my yeah. head about what can we do and the state's going to start doing some things about that. But other than that, I have to look at my notes or something. Like, look, yeah, look. yeah. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. I just, I just didn't. Uh, I don't know. I'm always curious. Okay. So we have. Um, Since you've been scanning your phone, yeah, and here's all the information about who's buried there, right? That'd be good. Carol sent me, you know, just like 15 minutes ago that just wants us to uh, get an update of what's happening with the depot. So, you know, independently from us, she's been working really hard behind the scenes to get the application to get the depot on a uh, register of historic places. And get research with Carol's really, really good at. She's been sharing some tidbits with me along the way. And then Doug met with Carol because he was part, well, he was hands-on, hammer in hand, when they moved the depot to its current site in 1982. And um, so anyway, Carol just wanted me to know that they're close to getting this, this thing submitted. And then also the Canby Historical Society, which is a nonprofit, that's who is in the depot, that they've submitted a Kinsman grant application Kind of hard to get, and to try to get there's a lot of painting that needs to be done and repairing of the structure. A lot of work to be done, there. so they're trying to do that. So that's in progress. And then there's a flea market at the um, fairgrounds uh, and event center that's on May 14th, um, and it's uh, it's one of their number one money makers uh, for the depot museum. Uh, so if there's something we can do to um, go over there and. And some money, or you know, it's just the entrance fee that makes them a lot of money. So, so anyway, she just wanted everybody to know that. Okay. And the depot should have gone to historic places just 50 years ago. Yeah. Peggy Siegler, who has been involved yeah. in this historically for years and years, she thought it was. She was shocked it never got get on yeah. the register. So I don't know what happened right now. sometime in the 80s or 90s, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. But now it will be. I mean, we don't, you know, I mean, the application has to go in, but knowing Carol. The thing is, the state kind of poo pooed it a few years, well, in the 90s, because they don't like to register heritage resources that have been moved. But I mean, give me a break, people. So um, uh, that's one reason why Ron's input, sorry, Doug's input was so helpful because he was there and knows why it was moved and how it was moved and why it sits where it sits. And that verbal history that we can add then to that application. Is invaluable. It's yeah, absolutely valuable. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be here today. Right. It wouldn't. It wouldn't. Right. Railroad said you can have it. You should try to move it. Yeah. And once they're gone, they're gone. Yeah. Right. All these resources, once they're gone, they're gone. Okay, so I'd like to spend, I know we only have 15 minutes left, but I might need to spend 20. Um, I want to go through the, I have a presentation that uh, I'm giving to the mayor and the city council on Wednesday, which is just our annual report that you've seen us do this before. So sorry, Tyler has to. I did send that, yeah. I just wanted to talk through it very quickly and I don't need to cover every slide because some of them you've seen before. Uh, I don't read the whole thing. We'll give this technology, oh good, perfect. So if we could advance. So talk about, you know, I, the main thing is to make sure that the city council and the mayor, and I know they know this, is who we are, who you all are, you know, where do we, why do we do what we do, how do we get these, you know, requests for work, and what we've been doing in the last 12 months, and then I wanted to touch a little bit on this data and demographics thing that we're seeing from the cemetery, and then 
basically what we're looking for from them and what they, you know, ask them what they're looking for from us. I see this before, but I added Tyler. So these are all great folks. And then just, this is no news to you, but we have lots of things that drive what we're working on. And one of the primary ones, of course, is this year, uh, historic preservation plan that was done in 2020 um, by Northwest Vernacular. And that is our many, many recommendations. So that's a lot of the roadmap of what we do every year. Uh, we do get requests from citizens. I'll show you some examples of that recently. Um, certainly can be staff sometimes has something like, you know, working on a plaque. Um, and certainly the mayor and council can throw things our way. Uh, we A couple of meetings ago, we went through the state heritage goals and just to make sure we're aligned with that. And that drives some of our work. Um, and then I, what I call collabs. We've been doing a lot of, a lot of this lately where we're working informally with other groups on heritage related items and then what I call city collabs like the arch and we were working with the candy beautification committee and the logging bridge and that. Um, business leaders sometimes we work with um, and grant availability conference ideas. I'm sure I've got a half page of those from last week. So um, you know finding out what grants are out there and what are the restrictions on them and what can we use them for and what are other people and then the planning code for our city, which is built into the you know, general planning code. Okay, so this is where you've seen some of this, but I did update this since our last meeting. So this is basically our last 12 months, last May to this May. We choose May to do this with the mayor and the city council because May is National Heritage Month. So it's just our way of honoring uh, the National Heritage Month by having this update every year. So the first thing we always do is, you know, we're working on grants. We have two certified local government grants that you're familiar with, and then the Zion grant, and we're in the midst of working on those right now. Part of that is the fairgrounds research that Northwest Spectacular has been doing, and they're going to finish up tomorrow. Tomorrow, Wednesday? No, next day after tomorrow. Um, so that'll be good. Their research will be all caught up. They did come out and they did a site visit um, a month ago, maybe. So they did all their outside work. And I was just over there Saturday for the Spring Garden Fair. Anyway, so it's always fun to go over there. And I was telling my friends from out of town, you know, about the age of the 4-H Hall and what it was built for, and that the, the tree grove was planted by the Work Progress Administration in 1930. And I just, <laughs> 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 they were fascinated. <laughs> okay, and then in the upper right, you see this picture. That's Judy Moss, who's well known around town. She. Uh, she's uh, the chair, I think, of the Mark Prairie Heritage, Mark Prairie Historical Society. And so the Mark Prairie one-room schoolhouse uh, out by where I live, you know, was severely damaged by a big ice storm. Um, it's been propped up and they had a new ridge pole put in and they've had a tarp on it for many, many months. The contractor is supposed to start, I think, next month. They went through many, many iterations of designs with the state, uh, with the county and getting contractors. And so they're on their way. And then um, the family, the Mark family, comes to that site every year in July for a family reunion. They come from New York, Canada. We've been there a few times for that. And they come from all over and they have a family reunion and they also spend the day cleaning up the site, um, cleaning up the building, which usually means uh, sweeping up the house. Um, and they were at, they were last year when they were there, they told Judy, we're going to scrub these headstones. And Judy's like, you will not, you know. You will not. You're going to get Judy DeRoche and the HLC, and we're going to be trained properly, and we're going to use the right tools, and we're going to use the right solution, and we're going to do it the right way, and you do not touch those. <laughs> so we did, anyway. <laughs> so that was a fun collab. That happened, I think, last, it was October, actually. Um, anyway, we helped them work through some grant questions they had about the restoration of the building and um, working with contractors and things. So we continue to be a partner with them informally on that. And then on the, the yellow there, city collabs. So we collaborate on flat content, the arch, um, the logging trail bridge. So I want to thank Ron, because I know you help us be our liaison with the uh, with the bike and pad, especially you know when they're talking about the logging road. So I want to thank you for that. There's probably, when you get back here, we should sit down and talk a little bit about what's going on with that to get caught up a little bit. Um, so thank you for your efforts there. And then, as I mentioned earlier, Jennifer, thank you for your efforts on helping us write the content for the plaques, the arch. And then on the bottom right, you know, we tried 
we tested the concept for a heritage pub night at Wayward. And I'd like to say it wasn't a, an epic fail because it was very well received by the four people who attended. <laughs> 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 and Pat Morrissey of Wayward couldn't have been more gracious. It's like, it was just a song I did. Let's do it again. You know, we'll try another. Let's try something different. And so now we'll think about it. <laughs> and down on the right, again, is acknowledging what's going on with the Candy Depot. And thank you, Carol, for all the research that she's doing it behind the scenes. And thank you, Doug, for meeting. I mean, you're our historian extraordinaire. We really, really, I mean, it's going to put that over the top. It adds a perfume to that request that wasn't there before because there were, there were you know, persnickety about the fact that building was moved. And thank you all for our uh, successful cleaning in September, uh, the cemetery cleaning. And then up above there is another uh, lab where occasionally a citizen or a group of citizens will ask us about a house or a neighborhood and we fill them in with information in um, North, Southwest Third, uh, the neighborhood was concerned about some development going on there. So Carol and I went through and we did our own reconnaissance survey for that group and then gave them all the next steps, which are huge hurdles. So that's basically where that's been left as of now. And then the bottom left is uh, the work that Northwest Vernacular is doing right now on finalizing the reconnaissance survey. And they'll give us a final draft very soon. And then up in the yellow there on the left, you know, we try to stay up, you know, um, with what's going on with what other cities are doing, creative ideas, how, you know, what grants are being done and how hard are they to get, whether it's just for historic, you know, resources in cities or the cemetery as well. So we're lucky that we can, we can attend those. They're either usually free or very inexpensive. So it makes it nice and Carol and I have the time. So that's helpful. Okay. Next slide, please. This is a kind of a new one. It, I'm trying to explain to folks what these CLG grants do. And it's really hard to know if, you know, we keep doing this work and we've been doing it for years now, but to what end? And so what these do is they help us peel the onion so we know what we have. And so it's documented not only with us, but with the state. You know, our planning departments know what we have. So um, this is sort of a chronology. It's, it's not as linear as this, but if you can slide up a little bit um, down, sorry, down. Yeah. Oh, that's good. So we start out, um, we get a list from the county. Uh, we tell the county which areas we're looking at, and then we get a list from them, and then we drive by and with HLC members and others. <laughs> and we look to see, was that is that still there? You know, it says the structure was built in 1901, but it's still there, is it gone? Carol and I, when we were doing the RLS for the Southwest Third neighborhood, there was a building, a house, and it was built in 1906. Probably shouldn't say this, but we drove by and it looked like that house in the movie Beetlejuice. You couldn't recognize it. I mean, you wouldn't have known. And that's kind of what we look at with the drive-by. And then after that, we get the next level of peeling the onion is uh, Katie and uh, Spencer, or whoever we hire every year, does this reconnaissance level survey or RLS where they they stand outside the structure, they take pictures that are very state specific. Uh, they don't go in, they talk to the owners if they come out. And this year, um, Jamie and the city sent um, postcards to the property owners ahead of time to let them know that this was happening. And Katie and Spencer said some people did come out and they wanted to talk a little bit about the history of their property. And so this is what they're continuing to do for us, just a chunk of town at a time. And people say, well, how do you decide? Well, we look at what's most vulnerable, or we look at what might have a, a property or a building that might be what they would call significant or contributing in some way that it has some, there's something really significant about it, just from looking at it, that we know there aren't any others around like it, or it's a really good example of some specific um, building or house structure or something. And, but it also does a lot more than that because we look at that, we take that data and we can look at, okay, it identifies, do we have some significant contributing buildings or structures or sites? It could be an empty lot, honestly. And then we know that we have a record of where we have something that if it goes, it's kind of bad, you know? And it helps the planning department, Helps the city works, it helps every public works, it helps everybody because let's say we want to widen the street. 
Well, they might want to look at what's on that street. You know, is it something really significant? Uh, might something bad happen? The, you know, ace glass if they widen the ivy. Yeah. Um, so these are the good things we want to know. It, it just helps. It helps people make a more informed decision. And then, so the next level, the next peeling of the onion is the um, intensive level survey. And so far, there have been 12 done to date. That's an individual property, a building, it could be a house, it could be a church, it could be a business. And that's a very detailed, uh, again, from the outside, but also with a lot of historic research. And it details a specific site that we have, that they have deemed, that we have deemed is really significant for some reason. And in the future, we may want to try to get something registered on the historic register, whether the national or the state. And you need an ILS to do that. And so then the next thing that comes after that is we have uh, 12 of these for different structures in our town. Um, and then we have the next level is to get something registered, which is a big hurdle. Property owners have to be involved. So in town, we only have one on the national register. That's it, one. And that's okay. I mean, it's better than none. Um, and outside of town, we have many on the, the county register, including our prairie school. Um, and then we have others, we have four others in town that are on the local register. But anyway, so again, peeling the onion toward maybe protecting it, protecting these properties. And then we're thinking about maybe there's some part of downtown on first or something that if we can get through a few of these, we'd be able to get a historic um, district registered. And, and um, that could be really interesting. Um, and, and that opens up another world of grants. So up in the upper right, there's a picture of a pony. You probably can't see it very well, but I'll tell you, I don't think I told you this story before, but I used to work for Nike's CIO. And Oregon guy, grew up on a farm, smart man. And he used to throw barnyard analogies at me, especially when he was irritated with me. <laughs> And so if I would present things like this to him, like, you got to do this, and then we got to do that, and then, and then, you know, the world of opportunities opens up, and I would say, you got to do this, this, and he would lean over to me, and he would say, Judy, there better be a pony behind the file. <laughs> and I would say, Gordon, Gordon, there's a pony, there's a pony. <laughs> so I, just, I don't mean to make fun, this is a memorable thing, but it's a file. You know, it is a lot of them. Will we ever get to all this? I don't know. Some towns have, and um, but it's a lot. It's a lot to get through. But the thing is, this uh, when we did the historic preservation plan, they did surveys of our citizens, and this is what they want. They want. They like the vibe of downtown. They want it protected. So we do need to take these steps um, if, to get this an area protected. And then the Kinsey grants kick in. So an example, Carol gave this to me a couple weeks ago, that in Astoria, and I'm sure, Ron, you went to Astoria not long ago, you probably saw this building, it's Order of the Eagles, it's an Order of Some of the Odd Fellows. So one building, they went through this process in Astoria, they have a small uh, historic district. Not all the buildings are registered, but one building, some are. And one of the buildings that registered, this one building that is registered just got a Kinsman grant for $250,000 for one building. And that's the Kinsman grants, that's the Boeing, man, that's the Boeing. Um, and they don't, they don't pass that money around easily. So you gotta go through a lot of, jump through a lot of hoops and go through a big pile to get there. And so we're just keep, we're gonna keep on keeping on unless somebody tells us, you know, we can't, we need to stop, but in the meantime, this is where we're headed. This is why we're doing this. In addition to just giving candy staff and everybody more information about what we have and get it reported. So that's that. Okay, one more. Let's see, you guys okay? It's just a few minutes. We're running a few minutes long. Good. Yeah, yeah. Sounds good. This is backstop. Yeah, backstop. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, you got, I don't need to, maybe if you could scroll down. So you've seen these pictures, I think, the before and afters from this year. And this is my way of helping the, the city, um, well, the mayor and the commission, and the uh, council members know that some of these have not been read in decades or could not be read and maybe in a hundred years. I mean, we all know that because we've been out there scrubbing. And so here's a picture of Karina spraying the D2. 
and the young man on the upper right, that's one of Rachel's sons, that's Jack. Oh no, Amy's all along the wrong way. Anyway, that's Jack, uh, Rachel, one of his, his sons, and he's using a bamboo spoon to, you know, clean out the, the words, and he did an excellent job, worked really hard. So if you'll go to the next and last. This is what I want the city to be a little bit more aware of, and I know you guys know this. So we started out with this big paper document on the lower left, and on the city website, it shows that the old section of the, uh, the, the historic section is not mapped. And they have a PDF scan version of that big paper map. But it's, it's it, the last entry on it was from the 70s and it's very incomplete. So, you know, we converted that to a big database. And um, a, a lot of us, especially Rachel and her sons, have filled in a lot of this information. So you kind of see that in the middle of the scribbles up and down the roads. And we updated 97% of the record. So each person is a record. And we updated 97% by you know, scrubbing headstones, reading the information. Um, some of it's just a date, some of it's a date and a name. A lot of the name spellings were Americanized in the data in the original data the city had. So um, like a spelling might be, I don't know, uh, Yosef, that we that it, on the database is Joe. I saw a lot of that. You know, it's just that I don't know, it's what they did at the time, I guess. But then as we collected this data, you know. Data geek I am, I started playing around with the data. And the top right is how long of the people in the historic section, so 1,700 people, how long did they live? And this is 100% uh, of the data that we have. And you can see this is 100 years ago, for the most part, they lived a long life. They were healthy farmer people and stayed out on their properties and probably didn't commingle a lot with people. And so it's amazing because when you look at some cities, like when Spanish flu came around, a lot of people died of Spanish flu, but not here because people just didn't commingle that much. Really, they were busy. And then we've seen this data before, like how they died. Um, um, some of it, you know, words that you don't hear these days anymore. Um, lots of train accidents. Really sad. One man was running along downtown Canby to catch the train that was just moving on the track, and his hat flew off. And he leaned over to pick up his hat and he fell. And that was the obituary. So the obituaries are very detailed. They, they'll tell you every story detail you would ever want to know. So anyway, we're just curious, you know, how did these people live? How did they die? How long did they live? And that map on the lower right is just the ones that I, I have the same map for the United States. It's a heat map, so the darker the color, the more people came from there. So anyway, so what do we do with this? I don't know. You know, will we do anything with it? Maybe if we do this detective thing or we do some interpretive signage or, uh, but it's, or maybe, you know, we get some school trips out there or something, a detective brochure, you know, just to let them know or, you know, show them that life was very different then. And, um, you know, all that history is just laying out there. Yeah. Fun yeah. intended. Yeah. So, you know, like the temporary find a grave and that's a big site it is a legit site um, millions of records I've used it I also have set myself up as a resource so it's crowdsourced so it means anybody can go in and update it a family member or you want to say hey my grandmother's there but my grandfather's there you want to update anything or upload an obituary it's all there um, and I've set myself up as a resource so if somebody goes to that site and they want a picture 
or they want some more information, it'll, it'll, the site will email me. And I had a few of those, someone in Missouri wanted a picture of her grandmother's grave or something. I don't know. Anyway, it's no big deal. Um, but the thing about Find a Grave is it was started as a grassroots effort by one person, just one man. This was like, he was like me, you know, and we got to get this information in everybody's hands. And then he sold it recently to Ancestry.com. So I'm worried that, I mean, that's a great resource. That database will always be golden. I mean, it is to me the system of our historic burials. Um, and maybe some people get out of that business at some point. All this information, the art work, uh, the people on the team has all of this that I've done. Um, but you know, my ancestry charges a fee. And so I'm worried that now that they've acquired this, that at some point they'll start charging a fee for people to look at it or contribute to it. And, um, but somebody told me at the conference that when the person sold it to them, he stipulated they could never charge a fee for the usage. I don't think that's legally binding. I've never heard of anything like that. So um, it worries me a little bit just because you know we want this information to be available. People say, well, why are you doing all this when ancestry has? They don't have the same. They don't have all of it. But it, it, I just, I, mean, I, I talked to multiple cities last week on the conference. Some of them, it's the historical society that has it. Some of them have a genealogical society in their town. But it's a big conundrum as who owns this data? Who wants it? It doesn't have to be continuously updated. It's updated now for us. There's no more updating to do. Um, unless somebody finds some obscure data that we don't know about. But if you want to really go down the deep hole, we start history hole, the newspaper.com. Right. I think yes. industry bought, I think yeah. I own them too. Because yeah. it's description is like bundled into it now. Like that oh, is, is okay. that's fascinating. If you go on there and type in search word, you can find yeah. the earliest um, right. newspaper from here. Right. It's, it's, a lot. it's really, really interesting. Anyway, so here we have, you know, it, we collected this information and it's a one time thing and it's all electronic. It's sitting on my laptop. But um, the, the Historical Society has it too. Um, so, it, you know, we have it. We decided to do something with it. All right. Questions? I think that's all I had, really. I was say that three years ago, I was on the National Cemetery website. In the upper left section says find a grave. I didn't realize that was the website. Oh. So I kind of the last name Berkman. There's about 10 pages. Yeah. And I'm related to most of them. Yeah. That was interesting. Yeah. I'll tell you kind of a funny story. Oh, I don't know. Ten years ago, my husband and I went to this small hometown in Wisconsin. DeRoche. It's not a common name unless you live in Wisconsin. I really didn't know that. I've never heard it before I married my husband. But we go to this small town which has a huge Cemetery. And we went to the person at the desk. There's a little office at the cemetery. And he said, How can I help you? And I said, Well, we're looking for my husband's friend. What's her name? And I he said, Jerosha. She goes, Oh my God. <laughs> What's like pages and pages and pages? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm very Wisconsin. Oh my God. Accent. So anyway, it was really fun. All right. So, um, I'm talking to the mayor and the city council. And please attend if you can, the more the merrier. I'll be doing it here with them physically. So we do every year, and they're very supportive of us. I mean, couldn't be more supportive, really. You know, we serve at their pleasure, and it's our pleasure to do so. That's how I look at it. So um, we really appreciate that they allow us to do this and that they um, you know, want to be sure that we have a heritage, that we're serious about heritage. The city staff cares and have support and support on our regular basis. Anyway, it's a it's a great it's we've done this before and they appreciate it. We enjoy doing it. It's to show all of everybody off and what you're all working on. All of you. That's all I had. All right. Stay tuned and thank you very much. Welcome back, Ron. Bye. Thanks. Thank you, Tyler, for helping us. Thank you, guys.